Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Well, let's go ahead and begin class with prayer this morning. Gracious Father in heaven, we are so thankful again for our opportunity to come and spend time with each other, uh, focus our attention upon you and your kingdom of love. We ask that your spirit will join us in our study, that as we study the truths that you've uh, revealed to us in your word, that we can come to a deeper uh, intimacy with you and be more faithful in our representations of you to the world around us. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. So we are doing lesson number 10 in the study guide on death, dying, and the future hope. And the title of today's lesson is The Fires of Hell. The Fires of Hell. And we have talked about this, written about it, presented materials on it many times, including in our sharing magazine, The Final Message of Mercy to the World, The Three Angels. So rather than me just launching in, uh, to start with, I want to see if there's any questions you all might have that you'd like to be sure we maybe answer during our class today. So on the fires of hell, any questions about that that you may have? Jim, I had a friend that had a question one time came to me. They had gone to uh, a church, I'm not going to name, and said the pastor got up and lit something up front and told them if they weren't good and all that, that's what's going to happen to them, and they saw fire. And they were really upset when they came to me. Okay. Yes. I have a question about those that are more guilty, burning for longer, etc., than others suffering for longer. Okay, so that some burn longer in the fires than others. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, we'll, de we'll definitely address that. Any other questions? Well, let's launch into the, the, the class, but if you have a you know, I saw, Michael, do you have your hand up? So, how did the, uh, after the New Jerusalem is on the earth, how do the people, the outside the city, how do they perish? Okay, okay great question. All right, we'll answer that one too. Good. So let's launch into the lesson and see, see where we go from here. The Sabbath lesson that describes traditional view of hell with never-ending torment, and also in Catholic theology, the punishment to purge sin called purgatory. Then the lesson goes on to state, quote, in short, a false understanding of human nature has led to terrible theological errors, unquote. I would suggest that it's not simply the belief in the natural immortality of the soul alone, it is the belief in the natural immortality of the soul coupled with some other false understandings, including one, a false understanding of God's law, a false understanding of the sin problem, a false understanding of the solution for the sin problem, and ultimately a false understanding of God's character. All of those coupled with the false understanding of the nature of man lead to the traditional view of a place of eternal torment. So the idea of the immortal soul, coupled with the idea that God's law functions like human law, therefore justice requires sin be punished. The idea of punishment is deeply embedded as, as justice, justice requiring punishment, is an assumed truth uh, that, uh, that, pe that is so deeply embedded that most people that hold that view, if you've talked to them, you'll watch this, they can't even step back for a moment from that view to examine the question, to consider the evidence that would undermine that view. Many people, if you suggest that, in fact, God, for justice sake, does not have to use his power to inflict punishment upon sinners, many people will immediately pull back and defend that false belief with accusations about what you said that are also false. They, they'll defend it. So, so if you were to suggest God doesn't have to use power to inflict punishment, they'll immediately go, well, if God doesn't punish sin, then there's no punishment for sin, so you must be, you must be teaching universalism. Or, if God doesn't punish sin, then Jesus didn't have to die for our sins, so you don't believe in substitutionary atonement. Uh, I've, have you had this happen? I've had this happen a lot. And, and so rather than actually uh, looking at the question on its merits, they defend the false belief with other false beliefs. It's a very interesting phenomenon. So before we discuss the topic about hell and God's uh, role in it, it's first important to define our understanding of God's law. And you know in our class, 
our position is God's the creator and his laws are the laws upon which he created reality to function, not just the physical laws, but the moral laws, how our minds and relationships function. And if you break those, you bring injury or damage to yourself. But the world being governed by created beings rather than a creator, beings who cannot build reality, make up rules and then use external power to inflict punishment upon people who break rules. That's how the sinful world operates. That's Satan's view of God's law. Every sin must mean its punishment urged Satan. And many Christians hold as a assumed truth that God runs his universe functionally no different than a human government. He makes up rules, he polices rule breaking, keeps record of bad behaviors, and eventually will use his power in a first a judicial process to determine guilt and innocence, and then add up the amount of suffering and inflict it. That's all really based on the assumption that God's law works no different than, than human law. And if you then assume that, then justice requires God to punish sin. And then the only question remaining then between traditional Adventists and the evangelical is not whether God punishes sin. The question that remains is whether the punishment is eternal or the punishing is eternal. That's the debate between Adventists and not Adventists typically. Uh, because they both accept the idea, well, God's going to punish. It's just whether it's eternal punishment, he brings an end to it, or he keeps on doing it. The lesson takes the position that the eternal burning torment of the traditional view, based on the natural immortality of the soul belief, uh, and that sin requires punishment, is worse than the common SDA view. And I, you notice I used the word common SDA view? because it's actually not the true SDA view. It's the common SDA view. And the common SDA view uh, is taught that because man is mortal uh, and sin must be punished, God only punishes them a brief period of time before he kills them. And that view is deemed to be better than the God punishes or the wicked suffer in the fires for all eternity. In the eternal punishing view, the reason it's taught that they suffer for all eternity is because in Eden, God created them with immortality and that some part of them cannot die. And so when Adam and Eve sinned, God's heart is broken. He doesn't want them to suffer. He's not against them. He's against sin, but these are still his disobedient children, but they're immortal and they won't be reconciled and they won't repent. His hands are tied. He's helpless. They're going to suffer for all eternity, but it's not his fault. It's their fault. In the Adventist view, the common, not the true Adventist view, in the common Adventist view, man is mortal. And sin requires punishment. And not all sin, sinners are equally guilty. Hitler has a lot more to answer for than a 15-year-old who never accepted Jesus and dies of a drug overdose. That 15-year-old is lost, but doesn't have nearly as much sin to pay for as Hitler. So God, when he pours his fire out, uses his power to create a miracle to make sure he keeps the people alive in the fires long enough to make sure they're tormented and tortured appropriately so justice can be served, and then he kills them. That's the common Adventist view. Now, which view is actually better about God? <laughs> Thank you. I heard several people say neither. That's exactly right. They're both terrible. Because in the common, uh, in the evangelical view, God may be sad, but he's pretty, um, well, like, well, he doesn't have much wisdom, discernment, or foresight because he created beings who, who could sin with immortality, and he either didn't know and didn't anticipate and didn't consider the possibility that they could rebel and then suffer for all eternity, or he did know and he gave them immortality at that point anyway, which makes him fairly sadistic. So that view is, is horrible about God. And the Adventist view that God uses power to artificially keep people alive to make sure they suffer before he kills them says horrible things about God. So both views undermine our ability to trust God and undermine our ability to know him. So, so what is the truth? In, in our magazine, um, The Final Message of Mercy to the World, Three Angels, we have everything I'm going to share with you on this written out if you want it 
in a reference source, you want to share it with people, we've got them, I think, in the lobby there. You can pick some up on your way out. And if you have a U.S. postal address and watching us online and you don't have one, you can have one mailed to you, just, just request it, or you can actually get the PDF off of our website. But let's walk through this. We'll kind of do it quickly because I've done it before, and there's other stuff we want to get to in the lesson. But starting in Isaiah 33, verse 14, the Bible says, The sinners in Zion are terrified. Trembling grips the godless. Who can dwell with the consuming fire? Who can dwell with the everlasting burning? And the next verse tells you who spends eternity in the fire. Verse 15, he who walks righteously and speaks what is right, who rejects gain from extortion and keeps his hand from accepting bribes, who stops his ears against plots of murder and shuts his eyes against even contemplating evil. The righteous live forever in the fire, not the wicked. I will tell you, you show this to most Christians, it, it, it explodes their mind. When I first read it, it didn't compute. It goes, this doesn't make sense. This is not what I was taught. And so I do what I was taught to do. I went to Scripture, and I started searching the Scriptures for what the Scriptures say about this eternal fire and everlasting burnings. And this is what I found. When God spoke to Moses at the bush, the bush is described as burning but it didn't get consumed. When God's presence came to Sinai, it's described as a consuming fire, but the elements did not melt. When Solomon's temple was dedicated, the priest could not enter the day of the dedication because the fiery, glorious presence of God was there, but the building did not burn down. In Ezekiel 28, it's Lucifer is described as walking among, quote, the fiery stones of God's presence. In Daniel 7, the Ancient of Days takes his throne and rivers of fire come out from before him and thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000 are standing in the fire and they're not harmed. Jesus, prior to his crucifixion in the body that dies shortly thereafter at the cross, so this is his mortal body, is bathed in heavenly fire at the Mount of Transfiguration. But nothing harmful happened to him. Hebrews tells us in chapter 12, verse 29, quote, Our God is a consuming fire. And the Song of Solomon says that love is as strong as death, its jealousy is unyielding as the grave. It, it burns like blazing fire, like mighty flames. God is love. And some aspect of God's glorious presence is, is seen by us, and it looks like flames of fire. And the lie that Satan has foisted upon the world is the place you don't want to go, and the place you don't want to be is the place of eternal burning and consuming fire. And that place is God's very presence, where the righteous, righteous are transformed purified, glorified, to live in his life-giving glory, but everything out of harmony is consumed. And in Revelation, Third Angel's Message, when it talks about burning sulfur, the word in Greek translated burning sulfur is theon, T-H-I-O-N, which is a form of the word theos, T-H-I-O-S. And theos is God, and people who study theos are theologians, or they study theology. And theon is the fire of God's presence, or divine fire. And that's where it says in the text that the wicked are consumed by this burning sulfur, and it says right in the text, quote, in the presence of the holy angels in the land, because it's the fire of God's presence. So when Christ returns, he doesn't come veiling his life-giving glory, he comes in the full splendor of his glory, uh, rivers of fire blazing out from before him, it says in Isaiah 6, 3. And when Moses came down off the mountain after spending 40 days in God's presence, what is his face described as doing? Glowing. Glowing, Glowing. Glowing or radiating. Did Moses have third-degree burns? No. <laughs> no. His, his whiskers didn't even burn off. And yet the people of Israel, when they saw him, it caused them suffering. They actually pulled away, and he had to put a veil over his face. And this is just a reflected glory. The fire of infinite love and infinite truth is painful to those still steeped in lies and selfishness. 
those who want to live in the, the, the darkness of their own distorted selves don't want to come into the light, the light of God's presence. And so the Bible says in Thessalonians that they are destroyed, the wicked are destroyed by the brightness of Christ's coming. Well, how can that be, though? How can we have a fire that doesn't burn bushes, doesn't burn buildings, doesn't burn whiskers, but yet burns up wicked, wickedness? Because these are the fires of love and truth that cleanse the earth from sin. These fires consume sin. They, they don't consume physical matter. You see, when you see, when you light a match and start a fire in your fireplace, you're creating something we call combustion, where physical matter is combusting and burning up and burning. You cannot burn sin with physical matter. We're, we're with combustion, because sin is not made out of physical matter. Sin is made out of attitudes, ideas, beliefs, and at its root, sin has two elements according to Scripture. One, lies. Satan is the father of lies. And what is it that destroys or burns out a lie? The truth. And the other element is selfishness, which is antagonistic to love or opposite of love. And love burns out selfishness. And thus, at uh, Pentecost, the spirit of truth and love fell, and they saw two streams of fire, the fires of truth and love. And it burned out of their heart, their distortions, their, their animosity, and it, it came into one accord. And so what happens in the minds of those who reject truth and reject love over the course of time. They destroy the faculties that are sensitive to truth and love. They create and harden themselves in rebellion and selfishness. And then what happens when their distortions, their denial, it wasn't me, it was the woman you gave me. I had every right to do that. She deserved what she got. And all the things people do to avoid personal responsibility. What happens to those hardened hearts when they are bathed in the infinite fiery presence of God's truth and love. Their lies don't work anymore. They gain awareness of their own true condition. They not only, in my view, not only gain awareness of who they are in character, they gain awareness of the pain and suffering they've caused others that they have harbored in their heart. What will it be like for the man who molested kids and never came to repentance and received a new heart and right spirit on this earth? What will it be like when, the, when they have full awareness, not just of the evil they've done, but the pain and suffering that the others experienced at their hands? This is going to be a horrible weeping and gnashing of teeth, not inflicted by God. This is the pain and suffering that unremoved and unremedied sin causes in the sinner. When God no longer shields them from the full consequence of what they've chosen, and he reveals rather than veils his full life-giving glory and presence. And this is why some do suffer, answer the question, why some do suffer longer in the flames, because these are not the flames of combustion. These are the flames of love and truth. And some with longer histories of rebellion and selfishness, with longer histories of lies, with more practice than denying, resisting, fighting against the truth, deeper embedded self-centeredness, they resist and fight against the truth longer, trying to deny, trying to resist. And this is why some are in the flames longer than others, by their own resist resistant and stubborn choice. And eventually, though, they all surrender and give up. The Bible further confirms what I'm saying about this with the story of Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, who took unauthorized fire into the, into the sanctuary before the Lord. And it says in the, in the text that fire came out from the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. And then it says in, Le, in the Leviticus 10, 1 through 5, it, it says that Moses sent in their cousins and had them carried out, quote, still in their tunics, unquote. Now, if I hit you with a flamethrower and burn you till you die, will you still be in your clothing? <laughs> Get to your mind. This fire that consumes sin does not is not the fires of combustion. They, they were not charred. Their, their clothing was not burned. But the fire consumed them, and they died before the Lord because it's the fires of infinite truth and love. It overwhelmed them, and they could not uh, exist in that presence with the corruption in their heart.
And eventually, the wicked will all surrender, give up, die like Nadab and Abihu, uncharred, unburned, dead bodies. And then after that happens, and by the way, this is, this is your question, Michael. This happens at the end of the thousand years after the uh, wicked are, are, are raised. And we'll come back to this question. But the fires come down, the fires of truth and love, burning for a period of time, some resisting, some not resisting, but eventually they all surrender and there's nothing but dead bodies. And after that, the fires of combustion come that Peter talks about where the elements melt in the fervent heat and the earth is then made new. That's, that's the, and so there's, there's two different fires there. Questions about any of that? And then the Revelation talks about the smoke of their torment rising forever and ever. <coughs> smoke is what is left after something is consumed or burned. And so in the Revelation, it is a symbol, symbolically representing, that the lessons learned, the memories of what happened, will never be forgotten by the righteous. The righteous will see how and why the wicked die, what the cause of the pain and suffering was, not at God's hands, but at the result of unremedied sin, and that God did everything he could to save them, and that we will never forget these lessons, and this is one of the reasons why sin never rises again. So I've just walked you through a scriptural, right down through text after text and story after story, giving you evidence as to why this is the way the reality is. And, and, and the wicked do suffer in the flames. The wicked do die eternally. There is an eternal punishment, but none of it is inflicted artificially from God. It is exactly as the scripture says, the wages of sin is death. Sin, when full grown, brings forth death. Those who sow to the carnal nature, from that nature reap destruction. And so we can have a perfect harmony where all the pieces fit, and God is completely trustworthy, yet he does not allow the unrepentant to go unpunished. He shields them, but eventually he sets them free to reap the punishment that sin brings upon them. So I, so I walked you through that, and now I'm going to, and I told you earlier that uh, our our position is the true Adventist position, and the common Adventist position is not the true Adventist position. Now, I'm going to give you some evidence for that. I'm going to uh, read a section out of uh, Great Controversy. We're going to unpack it, read a little, unpack it out of the Great Controversy, and show you what the, what the historic and true Adventist position is on this. This starts on page Great Controversy 541. God has given men a declaration of his character and of his method of dealing with sin. And what method do you think that declaration is? The, the author goes on to quote scripture. He has given a declaration of his character and his method of dealing with sin. And here's the declaration. The Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, unquote. What we just said. God is patient. He's gracious. He's shielding. He's shielding all of us from the consequence of what sin would do to us, giving us opportunity to partake of his remedy, to be reborn and renewed, so that when he appears, we can stand in his presence because we will be like him, because we will see him face to face at that point. He's giving us all this is all grace working, but he by no means will clear those or, or pass over and forget those who have refused any of that, he eventually allows them to step into reality. Understand this earth right now is in an artificial bubble of reality. An artificial bubble where God's full life-giving glory does not flow like it does everywhere else. You get a picture in Revelation at the end of the thousand years. When the new Jerusalem comes, it says the sun and moon will not need to light the place because God's presence will be its light. This earth is brought back into the harmony with the rest of the universe, where God's glory flows, as it says in uh, Daniel 7, rivers of fire coming out from the infinite. When we stand in this life-giving glory, we will have robes of light because we radiate that light that flows through us. We become conduits of it. That's the reality of the rest of the universe. That's why angels are, are often seen as fiery beings as well, because they have this life-giving glory flowing through them. But we live in an artificial bubble that God has shielded us and hidden his full glory, giving us opportunity to be restored in harmony. At, once, at, at some point, he removes the veil, 
His love giving flows again, and the guilty who have not been reconciled reap that suffering that sin brings. All the wicked he will he, will he destroy. The transgressors shall be destroyed together, and the end of the wicked shall be cut off. The power and authority of the divine government will be employed to put down rebellion. Yet all the manifestations of retributive justice will be perfectly consistent with the character of God as merciful, long-suffering, benevolent being. What law lens do you read that through? If you have the human law lens, there it is, retributive justice. You gotta hold people accountable. You gotta use power to put it down. You've gotta inflict suffering. You gotta make them pay. Design law? What we've already described. He brings to a close by stopping the intercessions because the intercessions do no more good. Every heart has been settled fully into either reconciliation with God or rebellion against him. And he lets each reap what they sow. And it says all of this is done in it's consistent with God's character. What are his means? What are his methods? How does he use power? What are the powers that he used? The power of love, the power of truth, the power of liberty. Notice now, this author will go on and describe the actual process. Keep in mind, this author is describing God uh, putting down rebellion. She uh, describing um, the manifestations of retributive justice. That's what this author is describing. And uh, I think I just got a text that might have told me that that the that the uh, the elements on hell might be in our, th our our beast one rather than our our three angels one, but I can't remember which one it's in. Anyway, that's why I got distracted. Somebody sent me a text. Okay, all right. So let's go and see what what this what this says. God does not force the will or judgment of any. He takes no pleasure in slavish obedience. He desires that the creatures of his hand shall love him because he is worthy of love. Now, pause right there. Yes. Reflect on that. Yes. Do you believe that to be true? Yes. 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 Then, if that is true, he does not want slavery to be. He does not force the will or judgment of any. Hmm. I want you to imagine lining up your spouse and your children and I want you to imagine you've got a flamethrower in your hands that and you tell them I command you to love me if you don't I will I will turn this flamethrower on and burn you till you die right now do, do you think you can get more love that way no. nope. so so if this is true he does not force the will or judgment he takes no pleasure in slavish obedience he, he, he wants us to love him because he's worthy of our love, then somehow his putting down the rebellion, his retributive justice, has to be in some way that is not coercive or threatening. I, I've already described it to you through the design law view and, and what that means, but this author is actually taking that same line of thought. Continuing on. He would have them obey him because they have an intelligent appreciation of his wisdom, justice, and benevolence. Why would God have us obey him? Because if we don't, we'll get in legal trouble and he will have to punish us? No. Because we appreciate his character of love, his methods. We agree. We adore him for who he is. Yes. All who have a just conception of these qualities will love him because they are drawn toward him in admiration of his attributes. See, love wins us, and that's the design law elements. The imperial Roman view coerces with threats of punishment. The principles of kindness, mercy, and love taught and exemplified by our Savior are a transcript of the will and character of God. And what else does the same author say other places is a transcript of God's character? 
His law is a transcript of his character. Here, the author says, the principles of kindness, mercy, and love taught and exemplified by our Savior are a transcript of the will and character of God. That's because the principles are the law of God, which are the protocols upon which life is built to operate and are lived out perfectly, the law of love and the life of Jesus. So these are synonyms. These are the same way of saying the same thing. You know, uh, unless you have the imposed law view, and then you hear the, 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 law, um, the law of God is a transcript of his character, then you list, hear a list of rules. That's never been true. God's law is a living law. You cannot actually appreciate the law of God written on stone. You can only appreciate the law of God fully lived out in the life of people who love others more than themselves, as Jesus fully lived out the law. Christ declared that he taught nothing except that which he received from the Father. The principles of the divine government are in perfect harmony with the Savior's precepts, love your enemies. There it is. We just said that. God executes, oh, oh executes, listen to this. God executes justice upon the wicked for the good of the universe and even for the good of those upon whom his judgments are visited. Reflect on that for a minute. Can you immediately see how it's good for God to do that? What law lens are you looking through? Impose punishments, keeping them alive artificially to make them suffer, to get them enough torture before he kills them. Is that what we're thinking? That's the common SD view. It's not the true view. It's not this view. What is justice? It's doing what's right. Do you hear that? And justice is determined by the law. So which law lens again are we looking through? God's justice is like the parent whose child has a terminal illness and the child refuses every intervention that would save and heal them. What does the parent, and we're talking an adult child now, what does the parent do if the adult child refuses everything that will heal them? What's the just action of the parent? That's what, that's what God eventually does. He lets go and he stops intervening, remove the IVs, remove all the artificial stuff, and let them have what they want. And God stops all of his internet and reveals his full life giving, and they reap in their person what the corruption of sin has, has formed in them. He would make them, no, no, this is exactly what this author goes on to say. He would make them happy if, if, he could do so in accordance with the laws of his government and the justice of his character. Why can't God make them happy? Why can't he? Because they refuse to participate in the very basis upon which health and life and happiness are built. Happiness is the byproduct of healthiness. And healthiness is only possible in harmony with the laws of health or the laws of life. Thus, God's methods for making people happy are restoring them to harmony with him and his laws. And then we have happiness, we have life, we have well-being. They want to have happiness in sickness, in disease, in defect, but they want to be happy doing it. You can't have happiness there. You only have pain, suffering, and misery. Continuing on, he surrounds them with the tokens of his love. He grants them a knowledge of his law and follows them with offers of his mercy but they despise his love, make void his law, and reject his mercy. How do they make void his law? By replacing it with their own, their own human way of, of doing things, and then claiming that they have legal pardon through some legal payment made to propitiate the wrath of the one in charge. While constantly receiving his gifts, they dishonor the giver. They hate God because they know he abhors their sin. The Lord bears long with the perver their perversity. But the decisive hour will come at last when their destiny is to be decided. Pause. What determines their destiny? Who determines their destiny? Is their destiny decided by a judicial finding in a heavenly courtroom in an investigative judgment that's going through record books and ultimately weighing out all of the elements of their sin deeds and which ones had blood paid to it and which ones were pardoned and weren't and mathematically adding all that up and coming to a conclusion that judge decides, oh, there's one they never repented of, guilty. Guilty. <laughs> 
Or, or is the destiny decided by the sinner when they cross the line of repeated rejections of the Holy Spirit such that they permanently sear their conscience, harden their heart, and destroy the faculties God has given us that are sensitive to the movements of the Spirit of Truth, and no further amount of truth or love would have any redeeming impact upon them, and thus their destiny is decided. <clears throat> Which is it? I take the latter. Notice what goes on to say. Will he then chain these rebels to his side? Will he force them to do his will? What methods? This is a re these are rhetorical questions, meaning that God will not chain them to his side, and he will not force them to do his will, and therefore he doesn't coerce, and he doesn't threaten to make people perform in the right ways. Next sentence. It says, those who have chosen Satan as their leader have been controlled by his power and are not prepared to enter the presence of God. Pride, deception, licentiousness, cruelty have become fixed in their character. Fixed by whom? How did these things become fixed? Did God use power from heaven to fix this stuff in the character of the rebel? If God judges their characters fixed in rebellion, as this is described, does God's judgment that their characters are fixed in this way cause their characters to be fixed in this way? No. Get your mind around what God's judgment is. God's judgment does not actually determine the outcome of the wicked. God's judgment confirms the condition of the wicked. God's judgment, you could put it this way, is the accurate diagnosis of what actually is in every heart and mind. What we have chosen to trust God, to open ourselves to the Spirit, to be reborn by the power of God so that we get new hearts and right spirits, and he judges us reconciled to him through the workings that he has provided via Jesus Christ, or he judges that we have closed our hearts, we have hardened ourselves, we have seared our conscience, and we have passed beyond healing. There's nothing more left that would have any impact to win us. And we've done that to ourselves. That's his judgment. <clears throat> Can they enter heaven to dwell forever with those who, who they despised and hated on earth? Truth will never be agreeable to a liar. Meekness will not satisfy self-esteem and pride. Purity is not acceptable to the corrupt. Disinterested love does not uh, appear attractive to the selfish. What source of enjoyment could heaven offer those who are wholly absorbed in earthly and selfish interests? Could those whose lives, could those whose lives have been spent in rebellion against God be suddenly transported to heaven, witness the high, the holy state of perfection that ever exists there? Every soul filled with love, every countenance beaming with joy, enrapturing music and melodious strains rising in high honor of God and the Lamb and ceaseless streams of light flowing from the redeemed from the face of him who sits on the throne could those whose hearts are filled with hatred of god of truth of holiness mingle with the heavenly throng and join their songs of praise could they endure the glory of god and the lamb no no this author says why could they not does God use divine power to prevent them from being there, to inflict torment upon them? Or is it their condition is incompatible with God's universe, with God's character, with his design for life and health? And notice the language of the author here. Could they endure the glory of God in the Lamb? Will the righteous endure? Or will the righteous thrive? Right. It won't be we're enduring it. We will be thriving and growing in it. But the wicked, they can't even endure it because there's something in them that hates the goodness of God. Does God treat the wicked differently? Or is it the nature and character of the wicked that responds differently to the infinite fires of truth and love that emanate from the presence of God. Well, notice what the author goes on to say. 
years of probation were granted them that they might form characters for heaven, but they have never trained the mind to love purity. They have never learned the language of heaven. And now it is too late. A life of rebellion against God has unfitted them for heaven. Remember their destiny was to be decided? Who made the decision? They made the decision. They unfitted themselves by the choices that they preferred in what they loved and the methods they practiced and how they treated other people. Its purity, holiness, and peace would be torture to them. The glory of God would be a consuming fire. This is huge, folks. Get your mind around this. Why will they experience this as torture? Is God actually using artificial power to inflict pain and suffering, which is the classic common view of the Adventist teaching? He is not. That's why it's not true. Purity and holiness and peace is what emanates from God. These are the methods of being described in this, what we're reading in this section. Yet purity, purity holiness, and peace cause torment to these unrepentant. It is their condition that causes the torment when God no longer shields them from his infinite presence. Notice what it goes on to say, the author. They would long to flee from that holy place. They would welcome destruction that they might be hidden from the face of him who died to redeem them. Don't you remember that the revelation describes when he appears in his glory, the wicked cry out for the mountains to fall on them and hide them from him who sits on the throne. Many Christians read that. That's because he's angry, he's mad, and they're scared. Well, they probably see that, but that's not coming from Jesus. That's coming from, have you ever seen people who have a, a, a hearts of a cheat? They cheat on everybody, and what do they see in everybody else? Cheater. That's right. They don't trust anybody because they think everybody else will cheat like they do. Yeah, that's right. So what do the what do the wicked actually want? They want to die and and, and not live in the in the presence of God. They want separation from God. And and, and who is the source of life? God. God. Okay? Now notice the next sentence from this author. The destiny of the wicked is fixed. I mean, earlier we said that there, the time has come to, to for the decide their destiny. The destiny of the wicked is fixed by their own choice not by a judicial action or a judgment from God in heaven. The destiny of the wicked is fixed by their own choice. Their exclusion from heaven is voluntary with themselves and just and merciful on the part of God. Like the waters of the flood, the fires of the great day declare God's verdict that the wicked are incurable. Get your mind around this. This is huge. Do you understand that neither the evangelical world nor the common SDA view teach what I just read? This is the true SDA view. This is part of the message that is to lighten the world. God is not the source of pain, suffering, or death. Death comes from sin. Suffering comes from breaking God's designs for life and health. It all comes from deviations from God's design and breaking away from Him. Questions about any of that? Yeah, what's the S SDA view? The, the SDA view? Yeah, what is, what is the true? It's we the, just went through the true view. I just laid it out for you. Yeah, but you said there's the common and the true. Right. We just went through the true view. The common view is God uses his power to keep people alive in the fires as long as they deserve and tortures them to make sure they suffer in their body the afflicted amount of pain and suffering for the sins that they've never repented for, and then God kills them. Okay, and the true is what the sister wife thinks it. Yes, okay. the true is what we just went through and what we what we teach in our, in our materials. Sunday's lesson asks us to read Mark 9, 47 to 48, which reads... 
And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown in, into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And some people will use this to say, see, that worm means there is their soul and their soul will never die while we suffer. And that's, of course, a projection. The text actually doesn't say that. Uh, if you actually look this up in any Greek lexicon, you can look in the SD Bible commentary. The worm is most likely referring to the maggot, uh, the worms that eat, eat bodies. And the undying worm is not a symbol of a soul that can't die, but a symbol of the corruption that cannot be purged from them. And that, that's really what's being described here, that the worm of selfishness in their heart, we, they will not die to selfishness. They will not give up their self-centeredness. They would rather die eternally than actually be transformed and live into holiness, as we just read. So that's what it means. The worm of selfishness doesn't die uh, in them. It, it, it stays alive. And let's go into Monday's lesson. The lesson states that when, uh, when qualifying fire as everlasting, there's an implication that the fire will not go out until it fulfills it or fully consumes what's being burned. That, that's the, what's stated in the quarterly. And this is a part of the common view, but it's the untrue view. Uh, the, the classic, how many of you have heard, well, the fire doesn't burn forever. It only burns as long as it needs to until all the sinners die and all sins consumed, and then the fire goes out. How many times have you heard that? Ever? Yeah, all my life. <laughs> okay. and, and, and that is Satan's fondest wish. Satan's fondest wish is for the fire to go out because the fire, as we went through earlier in our, our lesson today, is the fire of God's life-giving glory. And if this eternal burning, consuming fire goes out, that means God has been overcome, and that's Satan's finest, finest wish. So the fire never goes out. What happens, sin is consumed, but the fire of God's consuming, life-giving glory burns for all eternity, as described in Revelation, where in the city, God's presence is his light for all eternity. Amen. Tuesday's lesson is about purgatory. Because of the imperial, um, the imperial imposed law, the Roman view of law infecting the church, uh, that sin requires inflicted punishment for wrongdoing, the Church of the Dark Ages taught that sin must be punished. This led to the doctrine of purgatory, where after death, conscious souls have their sins purged through punishment in purgatory. In Roman Catholic theology, theology entrance into heaven requires, quote, and this is coming from their catechism, uh, the remission before God of the temporal punishment due to sins whose guilt has already been forgiven, for which indulgences may be given, which remove either part or all of the temporal punishment due to sin, such as unhealthy attachment to sin. So in the Catholic doctrine, there are certain temporal punishments that a person has to suffer for their sin, even if the guilt for the sin has been forgiven through God's grace. And if they didn't suffer that punishment on earth, they have to suffer that punishment in purgatory before they can go to heaven. Ken. 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 Yes. Question. Yeah, I just had a question. Yeah. Backing, yeah, yeah. Just, backing up just a little bit. Uh, my name is Seth. Uh, nice to meet you. Um, hey, great. Yeah, you were saying, um, like, is Satan's fondest wish that the fire would go out? You're talking about, like, premillennium, and then after postmillennium when the world is, like, completely created all new, new, that's like a physical fire, is what you're saying? Or? So, so, the ad, so the traditional Adventist view is at the end of the thousand years, after the millennium, mm -hmm. the New Jerusalem comes down from heaven, the wicked are raised... Uh, and they assault the city, and as they assault the city, fire comes out from God and consumes them. And at that point in time, God uh, creates a miracle, burns some longer than others. Satan is many days burning out there and that, and eventually God's fire kills them. And after that, the fires burn up all the remnants of sin, and after that, the fire goes out and we have a new heaven and earth. Okay? My, uh, our position is those fires that actually consume sin... Uh, never go out because those fires are the fires of God's life-giving glory and they will bathe the earth forever and we will actually radiate that fire as well and wear clothes of fire. So that fire actually never does go out. Our God is a consuming fire. Yeah, our, our God is a consuming fire, uh, which is uh, Hebrews 2, uh, 12, 29. So you yeah. talked a little bit ago about, um, there's a quote, and it may have been a biblical quote, about like the elements basically being... 
Yeah, that's Peter. Now that fire, the fire of combustion will go out. Okay. Yeah. But not but the fire that, that consumes sin. Like the world is remade anew through that yeah. combustion. Yep. <clears throat> so after after the fires of God's life giving glory consume sin, which happens in living beings, um, if you had a gun that was used in a murder, that gun did not commit sin. Mm -hmm. right. Melting that gun in the fire will not consume sin. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay? Sin happens in hearts and minds of living beings. And it's rebelliousness, selfishness, deceitfulness. These are the elements of sin. And those are burned out with, with truth and love. Once the fires of truth and love burn out sin, then there's a fire of combustion that remakes the elements and the earth is made new so there's not all the damage that sin has done to the actual nature and all nature is set free from those damaging elements. That consuming fire, the, or excuse me, the, the fire that melts the elements, that fire will stop burning. But the life-giving glory of God that actually consumes sin, that one never goes out. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, can I ask one more question? I don't want to distract too much. It kind of goes back a step. Um, on the topic of like our choice is that con confirms God's decision or judgment, it's like the belief. Um, so what's being investigated during the investigative judgment? Just for my own curiosity, because I this is somewhat new to me. So I'm trying to understand like. So 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 I would tell you I'm going to push pause on that. Yeah. You can if you want if you want an Adventist reference. Out in the lobby should be, or you can ask uh, Dean or one of the others to go into our back there, we have our stores, and you can get our Investigative Judgment for the Modern World magazine, and that's really written for an Adventist mindset. So if you have an Adventist background and you want that one, you can get it. If you want one that actually speaks to the same truths but doesn't ha use a lot of Adventist historic references, uh, we have a new magazine that's in print and will uh, is at the publisher, will be coming out um, the next time I'm in town, which is December 10, and it's about Christ cleansing his bride. And, and, and if you like that metaphor better, it's really about cleansing the people of God to prepare them to meet him when he comes face to face. That's really what's happening. And we walk through the evidences of that from Scripture. But that's a very long, that's at least an hour-long conversation to walk through all that. So I, I'm not going to take the time to do that at this moment. But we have a resource in the building you can have when you leave today if you'd like that. Tim? Okay, thank you. Tim? Okay, Tim? yes. Yes. Am, am, okay, am I understanding this right, that the why some burn longer than the other is, and Satan burns the longest in, that, in God's presence? Is that because it takes him longer to um, accept that how selfish he is and, and what he's done? And uh, Acceptance is not, the, is not the correct word. Okay. It's not about accepting. What is it? Okay. It's about. No, no, it really isn't about accepting that. It's acceptance. It, it sounds more like a reconciliation. I accept. I'm bad, and so forth and so on. No, it, it is about no longer, no longer being willing to fight against the reality of God's presence. Oh, that He is the way He is. Yeah, He's fighting it, resisting it, trying oh. to deny it, and uh, and and He resists the truth, and He resists it, and and at some point He basically says. I, uh, I surrender my spirit back. I'm not going to live like this. He's not changed. He's not transformed. But the death of the wicked is voluntary with himself. They would rather not exist. They prefer, under, get your mind right, they wow. prefer wickedness. They prefer hate. They prefer harming. They, they get pleasure out of murdering and abusing and exploiting and, and killing and ravaging. They want a place where they could, they could torment and control and abuse others. That, they, get, they get pleasure out of that. They don't want to live in a universe as God's true universe is. And they resist that until the point goes, I'd rather die than live in this place of purity. So, so the, the Catholic view about purgatory, sins require, certain sins require punishment, and if you haven't paid the punishment, then you can go to a place of purgatory and finish the punishment, and then you can go off into heaven. So those who die uh, in grace but haven't yet fulfilled the temporal punishment due to their sins can go to purgatory. One of the major doctrines that, let, uh, that the great reformer Martin Luther rejected was the teaching that conscious souls are be punished in purgatory. He disagreed with his doctrine in two ways. First, he did not believe in a conscious soul that could experience suffering or punishment, and instead 
Luther taught that saints sleep peacefully. This is from Luther, quote, it is enough for us to know that souls do not leave their bodies to be threatened by the torments and punishments of hell, but enter a prepared bedchamber in which they sleep in peace. That was Luther. So he disagreed with the conscious torment of purgatory in that way, but he also disagreed in another way. Luther put forth a new theory, a new theological construct designed to free people from the fear of purgatory and the manipulation of an authoritarian church for the, uh, for the exploitation and benefit of the church by getting uh, living, living people to pay indulgences um, to launch their loved ones out of purgatory. Many of the recruiters or evangelists, I should say, for the uh, Roman church during this time in history would go from town to town with their little jingle saying, whenever a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. <laughs> okay. and, and this is the way they would drum up money. Luther hated this. He saw it as exploitive and manipulative and, and, and misrepresenting God. So he came up with a new theory. He, he, he expanded Anselm's satisfaction theory of atonement by adding inflicted punishment. And Luther began to teach that every sin of every human uh, past, present, and future were placed upon Christ on the cross and punished by God at the cross so that if you accept Jesus, then by faith all sins have already been punished and therefore when you die, there's no un unpunished sins left to be punished in purgatory. And he came up with the theory created, made up, out of thin air, out of his theological desire to, to eliminate purgatory, he made up the doctrine of penal substitution theology. <laughs> Unfortunately, the same root lie underpins both purgatory and Luther, Luther's solution. They both are built on the same lie. And the lie is that God's law functions like human law, and sin requires punishment. The, the Roman view, you, you get punished in purgatory. The, the, the Luther view, the sin is punished in Jesus by the Father. But both have a punishing God that punishes sin. And that, is, uh, and that lie needs to be removed. To complete the Reformation, we have to reject the imperial law or imposed law view and return to worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and understand God's laws or the design laws. Now, question for you guys. You're going to be uncomfortable. You ready to get uncomfortable? With, with three minutes to go in the lesson? This is where I was leading you on this. How is the SDA investigative judgment message similar to purgatory taught by the Roman church? Please tell us based on each sin. Each sin is going to be investigated yeah. and punished. Yeah. Okay. Both teachings, we'll go through it really quick, we don't have time to unpack it all, but both teach that at death, sinners are not prepared to enter heaven. Right. That's right. Well, both teach that actions can be done to or for the dead to complete the salvation process. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. What, what do you mean? Yeah, can you unpack that a little bit? Yeah, I understand that. For a I don't lot understand of it. <laughs> <laughs> the, Salve, the, the, the Adventist view uh, uh, on the investigative judgment is that sins have gone onto the books and you can't enter heaven until they've been erased. There's a process to complete the salvation process that isn't yet complete for you. There's an investigative judgment to eliminate out of the record books the sins it's often taught. It's a process. The Roman view, they're, they're eliminating the sin. So the Roman church teaches the sinner is conscious and suffering to pay their unpaid legal sin debt to complete the necessary temporal punishment of their sin. The SDA church teaches that the legal payment for the sin was paid by Jesus at the cross, and Jesus is mediating in heaven, applying that legal payment to the legal documents to purge from the record of the saints any remaining unpaid legal debt that would be required for them to pay at the resurrection if it wasn't purged from the books. It's ugly. <laughs> Pardon? It's, 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 it's ugly. ugly. But, it's but notice, uh, but for both, uh, who, uh, but for those who have not surrendered to Jesus, uh, their sins remain on the books and will be punished after the thousand years. Hand in the back? Yeah. Um, I've always looked at uh, when Jesus came <coughs> down to meet with Abraham, and they had this discussion about, well, how many are in Sodom that you're going to say? And, and, and Abraham whittles him down to ten people. And Christ uh, and the angels go off and, and uh, 
and walk into Sodom and, and sure enough there's not ten people there. In fact, there's really only one. And uh, I've always viewed that as a type of uh, the investigative judgment. And, and, and to a certain extent, that's kind of repeated all the way. God doesn't... Uh, I have so the question is, how is the Adventist traditional view of the investigative judgment similar to the Catholic view of purgatory? I'm just showing you the similarities. I'm not actually telling you what I think happens in the investigative judgment. I'm showing you the similarities here from the from the fraudulent penal legal view that the Adventist Church embraced after 1888 when they rejected the righteous by faith view. Okay, that's right. Okay. All right. Okay. But I've never viewed it as as similar. I've never viewed it as, as similar to. to well, of course it's not. Of if you were raised Adventist, you would never see these similarities because the, the Roman Church is is all evil, and, and the Adventist Church is all all the remnant. Okay, but but in reality, but in reality, um, they both the the after 1888, when they when uh, any anybody in the Adventist Church who rejected the righteous by faith message and embraced the imperial law message and the penal legal message, they're actually standing on the same foundation of the Roman Church. God's law functions like human law. This is the wine of Babylon. God's law functions like human law. God becomes the enforcer. God must punish sin. We have to have a mediator pay a legal penalty, plead it to God. And then we, in the Catholic view, we have a Eucharist that when you take the Eucharist, then Jesus offers his sacrifice to the Father to pay for the sin. In the Adventist view, all the sins are put on Jesus. And, and when you confess your sins, then Jesus goes to the Father and offers his merit to pay for your sins. But the sins were actually paid for back then. He's just applying the merit when you confess. The, the Catholic view is he's actually applying the sacrifice when you confess. It, it's, but they both have a God who has to be appeased by the blood of his son and, and pled with and, and uh, some legal payment made to so he won't kill you. It's the same pagan God. And most Adventists can't see it. I see it. The tr truth is that God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son, and the fullness of the, of the Godhead dwelt bodily, and through Jesus Christ he took up humankind damaged by Adam's sin and carried humankind to perfection, and he opens a new avenue so that all who trust him receive a new heart and right spirit, and we are partakers of the divine nature, and we are reborn to be like Christ in character, and he dwells in us. And, and there is no pleading with the Father to get the Father to be merciful. There's pleading with us to trust Him enough to let Him heal us. Amen. 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 So back to the, uh, the comparators. The Catholic Church, or view, has the remaining sins being punished in purgatory to purify the sinner and take them, and then take the sinner to heaven. The SDA Church has the remaining sins of those who have, have placed the, uh, have not placed their faith in Jesus being punished in their body through a miracle of torture at the end of the thousand years. So those who haven't confessed their sins, they suffer the punishment in their body at the end of the thousand years and lost. And the Catholic view. You suffer in purgatory and are saved. Our view, what we teach, there's no legal process going on at all. Amen. Only healing and restoration through the achievements of Christ. And in heaven, Jesus applies his perfection to the hearts and minds and characters of all who trust him. So the short version of what's happening uh, in the investigative judgment, in our view, is that all who place their trust in Jesus and died on the righteous journey of healing and transformation, but still had elements in their hearts and minds that they haven't either had full victory over or even come to the point they realize they need victory over, but they truly trust Jesus. Jesus fixes those broken places in their hearts and minds, their character, if you will, so that when they rise at the resurrection, they rise perfected. They don't rise as sinners still struggling to overcome sin. Amen. So, so the thief on the cross that accepted Jesus just before he died does not arise as a person who longs to steal from someone. Why doesn't he arise like that? Because in the investigative judgment, Jesus opens his record, and what's in the record according to Scripture? Your name, and what's a name, a metaphor for? Your character. So the thief gave Jesus, through his trust, permission to go into his record and cleanse it. 
And what's he cleansing it from? Everything that defiles. So he's removing all the desires for stealing and insecurity and fear and self-centeredness and all those things that remained in his character because he placed his trust in Jesus. So when the thief arises, he rises with a with a uh, a desire to be honest and loyal. Martin Luther, the great reformer, when he arises, he will not arise as an alcoholic craving a drink or as a anti-Semite hating the Jews and wanting to kill them. That will not be in his heart when he arises in the resurrection. It will be gone. How did it get gone? In the investigative judgment, Luther died trusting Jesus, and he gave him permission to search me and see the wicked way in me, created me a clean heart, and any residual elements that he didn't work out through God's grace on this life journey, Christ fixes in his heart while he's in a state of sleep, so he arises ready to stand in God's presence. This is my understanding of what's happening in the record books, which where our names or characters are stored for all those who place their trust in Jesus. But those who haven't placed their trust in Jesus, those records are closed. He has no permission. If you want to use a medical record analogy, there's no signed authorization to perform heart surgery on them. <laughs> That's right. That's the short version. And that's the version that is consistent with the design laws of God. And that's how the Bible describes all the righteous who partake the nature, the divine nature, who have new hearts and right spirits, who receive the mind of Christ, who have the heart circumcised by the Holy Spirit, who are reborn, who have the heart of stone removed and the heart of a uh, tender heart put within, who have the law written on their heart and mind, who have the, the new name with a new character, who partake the flesh of uh, and blood, uh, the flesh or bread, which is symbolic of the life of Jesus. This is the transformation. And a few and some people through history achieve this full restoration in their life on earth. Enoch, Elijah, and the final group that are translated. But most have this experience done for them while they're resting in their trust relation with the Lord. Wow. Amen. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love, and we thank you for your plan to heal and restore us to your perfection and your righteousness. We put our trust in Jesus, and we ask that we can be part of that group like Enoch and Elijah, who you fulfill and settle us into the truth, sealing us intellectually, spiritually, that nothing can shake us forth from it. And we will be faithful friends of yours, speaking and saying of you what is right, and that we will see you coming in the clouds and meet you face to face very soon. We pray in your holy name. Amen.